Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Good Order, I am Templar, and today we are going to be talking about Viking Ireland. Now this idea actually came to me from one of my uh, subscribers who actually wanted to, me to talk about this for Celtic Month, and I actually like to agree with that as well. In fact, this uh, period in Viking Ireland actually first starts in the timeline of 800 to 1014 AD, and it's actually stated that during this time, it's actually stated the Vikings who actually invaded Ireland mainly came here to plunder and such, yada yada yada. However, that's pretty much a lot of what people think. In fact, when people think of Viking Ireland, normally they think of, say, the Dane Law like in England. However, that's untrue. In which, it's actually stated that during this point in time throughout the history, it's stated that during the early years of Viking raids in Ireland, it was stated that the Irish were technically being attacked and destroyed by said Vikings, in which the stated the Vikings would actually attack the Celt-Irish monasteries in the said region. However, these monasteries were a lot different compared to, well, other monasteries in the regions of England. How so? Take a look at this tower. Now, if you all are thinking this is a bell tower, you're sorely mistaken. In fact, this was actually a tower that was actually used to keep people away from the Vikings. In fact, these were the monastery itself. These towers were a type of area where all the riches of the monastery were kept. This is where many of the monks prayed. This is where many people were taught. And in fact, this is actually a really cool part about history in Ireland. In fact, these type of monasteries can actually be seen throughout all of Ireland, and of which were technically used as monasteries until the Norman conquests, of which are kind of impressive. Now, that's the same though. By the time of the English, these were then replaced with said different type of monasteries which were later on turned into Gothic cathedrals. However, still I'd rather prefer the Celtic Monastery a little bit more. However, these Celtic Monasteries are only a footnote of history of how the, many of these would have actually been. And in fact, it's really cool though, besides the most greatest thing about this period. In fact, it's actually stated that the Vikings during this time, of which who early, in the early years, actually raided and pillaged many areas of Ireland, mainly along the southern coasts of Ireland, mainly because it was actually more richer and desirable. However, it is stated, though, that the Vikings also came to not just pillage, but also to live, to farm. And in fact, it's actually been stated that many Vikings actually were even hired by many Irishmen to fight in their wars against their fellow Irishmen. It's stated that an Irish king named Halgan de Black, or Harrigan de Black Hair, as some people pronounce him, of which technically is kind of weird because he had silverish hair. I don't know how he got it stated in history books he had silver hair, not black. However, this might just been the war paint that he might have put in his hair, so we still don't know. However, it is stated though that Hulligan actually was stated to have actually hired at least over technically 2,000 Viking mercenaries to fight in his wars against his fellow Irishmen, especially his fellow Irishmen chieftains in order for him to become, well, a king of Ireland, or high king of Ireland, but he truly never would be. He actually stated to have died sometime in a battle. Now, it is stated, though, that during this timeline, though, it is stated that the Irish technically fought against each other time and time again for control over the said region. However, due to the Vikings, this stated to have actually leveled up the flame field for all sides. In fact, the Irish were technically stated to have hired mercenaries mainly if they were weaker against a stronger opponent. As well, a very incredible part in history, it's actually stated that the Vikings actually created great cities in Ireland, such as Waterford, Cork, Dublin, Belfast, Limerick, and Wexford. These cities were actually the most famous of all. In fact, it's stated that the Vikings mainly controlled in the regions of, of Munster and Lannister, of which it's actually stated that during this time, the Irish who actually allowed them to say, actually had them, well, pay a type of tax fine. However, this is depending on the said region and who ruled it. However, it is also stated that during this timeline, it's most of the time even been stated that the Irish actually would even have sometimes fought against the Vikings, especially if the Vikings felt as though this so-called idealism would not work, or the Vikings saw a better land. However, this would not work out so well for the said Irish nor the Vikings. In fact, it stated that the Irish didn't live in said cities like you would think, like the Vikings would have. In fact, this is Dublin, made by the Vikings, and this is a city made by the Irish known as Calacum, or Carrigan. 
In fact, this is only one of them, and this was a major stronghold in the center of Munster. However, today it's still being hard to find in history books. In fact, we're only told by this type of story from the sagas, where you don't hear anything about it from Irish history, which is kind of a disappointment. So it might have been named something else. Anyways, this city was pretty much one of the most famous in history books, mainly because it had great walls and vast fields, and as well, great places to actually farm. However, the Vikings also had to deal with smaller tribal groups. These smaller tribal groups did have smaller cities. However, it was also a lot harder for the Vikings to take. Why? Take a look at this image here of elongated bridge along with a tower and including a fenced off entire circled homeland type city. This little small town, or city, whatever you want to call it, was incredibly impossible to penetrate. In fact, it's even been stated that the Vikings feared these type of areas for a major reason. One big reason we could see why, because it's technically a Noro bridge and you can only carry like at least one or two person across. And just think of how the Celts would have actually fought, especially with a Celtic shield wall formation. However, this is only one of the few type of Irish settlements that were established. In fact, it's actually stated that the Irish who actually created their own homelands actually did once have a hill forts, but due to the terrain inside the area of regions, it's actually stated that they later on gave them up, which you can see why. Now, also take a look at another one of these images. As you can see, this is an Irish town with what you may see of a type of massive type fort, or what do you want to call a stronghold, on a very massive light bed. Some even state this might have been the sea, but I don't think so. This might have just been a huge light bed or river bed, that would have, which would have been connected with the said village. In fact, it's even stated from this image here that we do see another version of that. So yeah, the Irish had different forms depending on what it would have been. In fact, the Viking invasions in the southern regions of Ireland were not as diverse as the ones that were in Scotland and including in the regions of England. Why? Well, this actually is only a theory, but many historians do state that the Irish might have fought back such in ferocious ways and manner that the Vikings could have not defeated them. In which, if we see with the history of the first true high king of Ireland, it's actually stated that Brian Barrow used massive guerrilla type strategy to defeat the Vikings, especially defeating none other than the historical famous Ivar the Boneless. So that is kind of famous, but technically that's the thing. Viking raids did not technically end, but it did drive out the Vikings in general. However, we do actually understand that during this timeline, it's actually stated that Ireland was a massive, well, hub for not pretty much, well, what you might call just land, but also riches. Not from in the ground itself, but actually sent there on purpose by many cultures such as from England, France, and pretty much the entire Christian Empire. For one big reason, the artwork. Now, I hear you already. Templar, what do you mean by artwork? Well, take a look at this Celtic imagery here. This is from a book known as the Book of Isles. And in fact, this type of beautiful artwork can also be seen on the Celtic crosses. In fact, it's even been stated that kings, priests, and even the Pope would have paid top dollar at the time for this type of artwork mainly because it was such beauty. In fact, Vikings actually wanted to actually sack many monasteries for this artwork. However, it's actually stated that most of this artwork would later on be uh, stated to have been taken by none other than King Henry the Fat. Now, it is stated, though, that during this timeline, this Celtic artwork was such beauty and such. It's actually stated that the Celtic artwork was seen throughout the entire medieval period by churches and many other clergy, mainly because it was so beautiful. However, by the time of the high medieval age, some say, it's actually stated somewhere in the midway point that the Irish might have started to lose their revenue due to the fact a new type of artwork is coming up. That would be Gothic type artwork. So we could see the problem with that, and in fact we could see this in his image with a Gothic church right beside the said Celtic monastery. So yeah, you could probably see why this did not end well for the Irish. Now, it is really impressive, though, that how the Irish actually would have lived and died. In fact, it's stated, though, that during this time in history, the Irish would have actually pretty much been the most famous people in history to actually have faced off against the Vikings, but not just in the form of fighting, but also in a form of peaceful negotiations. In fact, there has actually been one Celtic tribal people lineage from both Celtic and Nordic blood.
However, there are many names behind this. In fact, this would have been the names of Halcon, Luke, Alak, Nir, and Bob. However, these names are kind of odd and have probably changed over time. And unfortunately, might have turned into something else. In fact, there are several groups in Southern Ireland that actually do have a Nordic blood rather than they do have Celtic blood. And of which, you can actually see this even in their DNA and as well their hair design of them having a mixture between red and, well, blonde hair. This is really impressive. So, yeah, Celtic Nordic design in this history is still remembered. In fact, it's actually stated, though, that the Celto Norse in Ireland would have coexisted. However, it's actually stated they would have also not allying themselves together. In fact, it's actually been stated in some forms of history that many of the said Vikings would have actually caused problems for the said Celts. One of them which was when a Celtic chieftain by the name of Hersvenlu is stated that he was killed by a Nordic nobleman. This nobleman was stated to have been a Lubin Feinhair or Lugin or Lugin son. We don't know whether or not it would have been a witch or each, but it's stated that he would actually have killed this said, well, chieftain. Lou died from his wounds and as well was even stated to have actually been killed pretty much by a ruthless killer. In fact, some even state it was murder in his bed, some say it was right in open public. Others say it was an ambush that went wrong. However, we're still unknown to this type of point in history. However, it is stated though that his son, Haraganlu, would actually have fought against the Norse and as well fought and died in the process. This would later on lead to Brian Bro later on down the line. However, this, as I stated before, is diverse in culture and history. And the thing is, the Nordo-Celtic alliance in this region was extremely diverse and hard to understand. In fact, most of the Celtic history in this point in history is somewhat lost to time due to the fact of King Henry the Bastard, who really, really ruined everything for Ireland, especially since just because it was a Celto-Catholic religion group. So, you can see probably why this is probably one of the most hardest parts of history to actually replicate or even talk about in history books. In fact, the only type of point in history we technically remember about the Irish was technically during a time that were written down by the Normans, and that's not actually good information at all. So, yeah, but still, we could probably see why this point in history was actually a very good coexisting one until the Vikings or Celts, it depends on which one was fighting against who, started to cause the problem for the other person. Thank you guys for watching, please like and subscribe, and as well also click that bell button for notifications, and as well also check out more of our videos on the Celtic History Month, and as well let me know in the comments below if you want me to talk anything about Celtic History Month as well, and also check out our Facebook guys. Anyways, this has been Templar, have a great day. <laughs>